now. And I will hand over to you now, Sophia. Thank you very much. Ooh, firstly, I just want to thank everybody for coming today, taking off your Sunday. I really, really appreciate that. And I um, hope you've all been doing really well. Um, I don't know how things are in the rest of the world, but we were just saying things have eased off a lot now with COVID. It almost feels back to normal, which is quite nice. So, right, so today we're going to be looking at why healthcare was available to women in ancient Egypt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so let's start with um, defining what constitutes health or well-being. And there's a lot of definitions out there, along with disagreements, but I quite like this one, which is a satisfactory and acceptable state of physical, mental, emotional, economic, and social well-being. So I think, you know, it covers just about everything. So the inclusion of economic and social well-being, I feel is very important because status, just like nowadays in antiquity, would have played a crucial role for access to medical treatment. And societal perception of health and well-being is pivotal in understanding the care that was provided. So women at Dero Medina Workers Village, for example, appear to have had access to a state-sponsored as well as private health care, which is really interesting. So um, here on the slide and the previous slide, we can see the homes of the families that lived at Deir al Medina Works Village. I took this photo a couple of weeks ago. So during the week, it was mainly women and children that lived here, as the men tended to camp by the tombs they were building for the royal household at the Valley of the Kings and Queens. So, if you actually visit Deir Medina village, it's a very emotional feeling to go and visit it because literally their tombs are very close by. And if you look at the trek they would have had to, to do to get to the Valley of the Kings, it's quite a tough trek. So it makes sense why the men camped there during the week. And um, so like I said, they, they built their own tombs just to throw away from the home, literally one minute walk. And here we can see a worker's tomb. This is Nebenbat's tomb at Deir al-Medina. We believe he was probably an artist and you can see how beautifully he's decorated his own tomb. So they had an on-site physician, um, a village physician. And we know of one whose name was um, Pa Harry Pejet. And uh, we know about him because of an ostracon that was discovered is Ostracon 5634 at the British Museum. So he is also the first recorded pharmacist um, because the Ostracon mentions him taking time off to make prescriptions. So he has um, 39 recorded absences because this Ostracon basically records the absences from work. Um, 14 of these were for preparing remedies. Um, 18 were for attending workmen that were sick. And uh, I found this quite interesting that a, a workman actually takes time off because his daughter is on a period. Never, that would never happen now. But, um, the text doesn't go into any more detail, but perhaps she was having painful periods, excessive bleeding. But what this one text does do is provide a glimpse into the care of women at the village. We also know that women expected their children to care for them in their old age. Um, one particular elderly woman, her name was Naunat, in the village decided to disinherit the children that didn't take care of her and reward the ones that did. So I feel this example shows the status of women in Egyptian society, particularly during the New Kingdom period. Women had legal rights, they owned property, So, so how would women have dealt with the issues of puberty, periods, pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, raising children, and how would they have coped with menopause and its challenges? Now, menopause is an interesting subject because it's one that has been neglected even in the modern era until recently. 
So anyone who's been through menopause um, will tell you it's a lot more than just half flushes. There's a risk of osteoporosis, depression, brain fog, anxiety. In fact, um, many menopausal women, they're diagnosed with antidepressants rather than HRT. So fluctuations in hormones can have devastating effects on women's health. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that we're made to believe that the ancient Egyptian women didn't have to worry about menopause because they all died young. So yes, many did die with health issues, but it's simply not accurate that menopause would not have been an issue. So we're going to be having a look at this. We're also briefly going to look at um, the evidence of violence, uh, physical and sexual towards women and the medical care that women would have received. It's a hugely important and sensitive subject, which I feel needs addressing. In this slide, we can see an 18th dynasty vessel, which combines features of um, a woman with the hippo goddess Tauret. So this vessel would once contain salt, which um, would have been used by pregnant women to ease the strain of pregnancy, tackle stretch marks, and even prevent miscarriage. I think it's um, adorable. <laughs> it's really cute. And you don't see many of these, sadly. So how do we know what medical care was like for women? Well, clues can be found in um, human remains, medical papyri and ostraca, such as this one. There's um, also other textual evidence and imagery on temple walls. There are, of course, general diseases that the whole population had to contend with, such as schistosomiasis, malaria, bacteria, viral infection. But today, I want to focus as much as possible on gynecology, obstetrics, and I want to have a little look at disabilities as well. So a major issue has actually been aging, skeletal, and mummified remains in the past. So here I've listed various ways age estimation is carried out. It gets more difficult to age human remains after the age of 30, and therefore it's likely over 40s have been underrepresented in the archeological remains with non-adults, the dentition and the fusion of the bones helps provide a fairly accurate aging process. But once the bones are fused, it gets a lot harder to age. So the focus shifts on degenerative conditions, which can vary due to environmental, epigenetic factors, and also you know, the burial factors as well. So taphonomic processes also need to be considered. So basically it's very tough to age people once they, they, they reach a certain age. Um, sorry. <laughs> So texts and imagery from ancient Egypt depict old age, and there's paleopathological evidence from human remains recovered from archeological sites. Interestingly, there's a number of remedies in the medical papyri related to the whole aging process. This includes prescriptions for wrinkles, and uh, you can see one here. This is on the verse of the Edwin Smith papyrus. It's quite a long one, so, I'll let you guys um, read it in your own time later on, but it's an interesting one. There's um, also prescriptions for graying hair. You can see one here, which is, it uses cat placenta, poor cat, I know. Um, there's also the mention of a bird, which probably a raven, laudanum, resin which is uh, fried and applied to the head of a man and a woman although no, it says man <laughs> so there are examples of women that lived beyond middle age such as a mummy identified as Hatshepsut and she lived until the age of at least 50 could have even been older could have been 50 to 60 there are many other examples too. And I want to highlight this because it's important to note that not everyone died by the time they were 35. 
So we need to give more attention to old women, uh, older women in ancient Egypt as well. I feel, you know, um, older women are quite neglected in when we're studying ancient Egypt. So whether or not this mummy actually is Hatshepsut is a separate debate, uh, which I don't really want to go into today. Um, so if we put her identity to one side, but just focus on her as a medical case study, she provides a fascinating window into the health of an older elite woman. So her tomb um, was first discovered in 1903, and it was actually discovered by Howard Carter, and he found it to be pillaged in antiquity, and then it was rediscovered in 1989 by Don Ryan. The mummified body was um, remarkably still in the tomb. He found her in the supine position, so on her back, and he found her in the center of a burial chamber. And I want to thank Don Ryan for providing me pictures of the discovery of the tomb and some images of um, mummy KV60. So in this slide, we can see um, Don Ryan's um, picture of the steps of the tomb when he first rediscovered the tomb. And I think this is marvelous to, to look at this. So um, I want to read out some bits of what um, he wrote in his k article in 1990 when he first discovered her. You can see her lying here. How This is what she looked like when he discovered her. So he wrote, we opened KV60 on July the 4th, near the center of the burial chamber, lying on his back, directly on the floor, was an excellently preserved female mummy. The mummy was mostly unwrapped, and later measurements showed it to be 1.55 meters in length. Strands of reddish blonde hair lay on the floor beneath her bald head. The left arm is bent to the elbow, to bring a loosely clenched fist over the center of the chest. The nails of the clenched left hand are painted red and outlined in black, which I think is pretty cool. Um, Mark Papworth brought his coroner experience into play when he later performed an initial examination of the body and concluded that she had been obese in life as indicated by dramatic folds of skin found tucked under her backside the mummy's teeth are well-worn, suggesting an older individual. The body has been eviscerated through the pelvic floor rather than the side. So that's good because it puts it into perspective of what he saw. And um, then she was studied again by Hua et al. And they published the results in Scanning the Pharaohs, a book in 2015. So they determined her to be in considerable bad health when she died. Um, they say her cause of death was thought to be due to a malignant tumor that had spread to the bones, or she could have died from complications arising from diabetes. The diabetes diagnosis appears to be solely based on her weight. Um, her teeth were in very bad condition and she was determined they, they determined she was obese in life. Now, I couldn't find any CT scans of um, her body. We've got CT scans of her teeth. But reading the report and learning a little bit more about her, in my opinion, there's a strong possibility that she was also suffering from osteoporosis. And, um, you know, they did find that her, with osteoporosis, the bones get quite thin and quite they get quite brittle. And I've also looked at the CT scans of um, other mummies and the mummified legs that were found in the tomb of Queen Nefertari, there was evidence of osteoporosis. There's been other studies over the years where um, osteoporosis has been discovered in mummies over the age of 35, uh, particularly women. So going back to um, this mummy, um, her rate of death tells us that it's very likely she would have, would have gone through menopause. She was either still going through it or would have gone through menopause. 
In fact, some of the problems um, with her dentition, uh, I'm wondering if I've got this slide of her, okay. So here we can see her teeth. And to the left is an image by her Wasserall and on the right um, is labeled was the problems she probably had with her dentition. So some of the problems with the dentition, such as alveolar bone loss, which is in the jaw, and uh, receding gums could be the result of menopause because uh, with menopause, women find that they, they lose a lot of bone um, in their jaw as well as in the rest of their body. And I feel this is something that needs to be considered when studying women, particularly women the age of over 40. So during menopause, there's a dramatic drop in the female hormone estrogen. So bone loss in the jaw due to a drop in estrogen can cause gum pain, other issues like increased tooth sensitivity, loose teeth, missing teeth. Um, going back to, uh, so the diagnosis of um, obesity is always tricky in mummies because um, with the mummification process, desiccation can make the skin very loose. So um, it's very tricky, but I think, you know, in her case, she probably was overweight. Um, now, if she was overweight, again, menopause is a contributory factor because a decline in estrogen can cause weight gain around the waist and abdominal area. She also appears to have suffered from hair loss. I'm thinking, can you? I don't think you can see the hair loss, unfortunately, in the pictures, but she, she had a lot of hair loss at the front, but at the back, she had quite long red hair. So this, again, is um, indicative of menopause because women do find that they, they get substantial hair loss as well during menopause. It's actually menopause is a horrible, horrible time. So, um, well, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> I'll keep you on this for now. So estrogen is um, responsible for promoting the activity of osteoblasts. These are cells that make new bone. So therefore low estrogen levels can lead to a rapid um, decrease in bone density. So to deal with um, declining estrogen levels, women now have access to hormone replacement therapy. But um, interestingly, in ancient Asia, women may have had access to HRT as well to alleviate the symptoms of menopause. So for sure in 2016 stresses the need to rethink a case from the Cahoon gynecological papyrus, which I've got here. So it refers to a woman aching in her teeth to the point that she cannot, and I'm assuming open her mouth. So let's have a look at this case. So the case reads, examination of a woman aching in her teeth and molars to the point that she cannot open her mouth you should say of it, it is toothache of the womb. You should treat it then by fumigating her with incest and oil. Pour over her the urine of an ass or donkey that has created it like the day it passed it. Now, these words are interesting. And you know, sometimes ancient Egyptian medicine has been dismissed as irrational because of the wording or some of the ingredients they they might seem bizarre to us or, but what we find is when they're re-evaluated and better understood, a lot of them are quite rational. So toothache of the womb could be talking about changes related to the womb, um, bones, teeth due to menopause because of hormone fluctuations. And the clue is in the remedy that includes the administration of urine from a donkey that has just given birth. So the reason why this is interesting is because the first generation of licensed HRT was actually made from horse urine. So the reason is because a pregnant horse urine is packed with free flowing estrogen. So this remedy could be doing the same thing. 
and um, I've talked about fumigation. So uh, this is what um, possibly the women used to fumigate themselves. So they would put it between their legs to fum fumigate the vaginal area. So this was actually discovered, I believe, in 2016, and um, it belonged to a woman called Sajani. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. So it dates to about 1800 BCE, and it was, in it was found interred with her, and it was actually found between her legs. Um, so it's quite interesting to find it, you know, when you read about the remedies, but to actually find the vessel that they would have used is incredible. So there's also an interesting um, remedy for the eyes, which could be related to dry eye syndrome of nephritis. This again is something which women going through menopause or perimenopause have an increased risk of. So this remedy, it reads, um, examination of a woman whose eyes are aching till she cannot see, on top of aches in her neck. So these to me appear to be symptoms of blepharitis, which is often brought on by that feeling of having a foreign body in the eye. Um, then it continues, you should say of it, it is discharges of the room in her eyes. You should treat it by fumigating her with incense and fresh oil, fumigating her womb with it and fumigating her eyes with goose leg fat. You should have her eat a fresh ass liver. So I think the fumigation with oil and fat would have offered some relief to the eyes. Humidifiers are recommended these days to relieve dry eyes. Liver is actually high in vitamin A and helps reduce eye infections. So overall, this is quite a rational remedy. Menopause, of course, also um, causes vaginal dryness, something which is not really talked about. Yeah, women suffer terribly with this during menopause. So perhaps the fumigation with oil and incense was thought to relieve some of these symptoms, but um, it's not something generally recommended by health practitioners today, have to be said. Um, so please don't try this at <laughs> home. Um, there are creams available at pharmacies that can help alleviate dryness and also estrogen pessaries now. So I talked a bit about the Cahoon gynecological papyrus. So I feel this is a good time to explain it in a little bit more detail. So it was found in 1889 near Lahoon. Um, in Fayum by Flinders Petrie. It's actually called the Cahoon because um, apparently Petrie misheard a local and thought he said Cahoon rather than Lahoon. It's, um, it was translated by Griffith in 1893 and is currently kept at University College London. So the gynecological part of the papyrus consists of three pages. And uh, we know the date because um, on page three of the verso is dated to year 29 of the reign of Amenemhat III. So this is how we know the date. The, um, the recto medical text consists of gynecological instructions and prescriptions. So they're written in a particular format. So they always start off with treatment for a woman then suffering and symptoms, say that with regard to it, and then the diagnosis, then um, the prescription, make that for it. So it's always sort of in this format. So the substances prescribed, they include um, various fruits and herbs. We also get beer, which is quite nice, uh, milk, oil, and incense. So some of the ingredients are less pleasant and include tongue. So in some instances, quantities are specified and in others left to the discretion of the practitioner. So the third page um, contains prescriptions and information on how to determine the sex of the unborn child. Um, unfortunately, the papyrus is um, quite silent on obstetrics itself. We do find remedies for women in other medical papyri as well. 
these also don't seem to discuss obstetrics. So clues have to be found from other sources, such as imagery on temple walls. So, um, so childbirth, moving on to childbirth. So as you can imagine, it was difficult and fraught with um, complications that could result in the death of mother and child. It's thought that women started reproducing in their teens in ancient Egypt, but I have to say the evidence for this is quite scant and um, there's not a lot of evidence for this, but we do find evidence of this from the Greco-Roman period that they, they did marry quite young. There are some wisdom texts dating to the Ramesside period that advise men to marry young to start a family. But um, considering the non-royal population generally practiced monogamy and had their own homes after marriage, could they really have married that young? It's, it's something to think about, I feel. Um, and possibly the men were older and, and the girls were in their teens, I don't know. So, so how did women deliver their babies? So depictions on war reliefs, such as this one from Komombo Temple, shows they delivered their babies kneeling or sitting on the heels or on a delivery seat. The hieroglyphs to give birth also depict the squatting position and the use of birthing stools or bricks. The full hieroglyph to um, give birth uh, was called Meswet, and it doesn't look like women in labor were actually assisted by the physicians. The physicians were known as Sunu. It's most likely women took part in this, so it could have been women taking on the part of a midwife or older women who, who'd had the experience. So Ebers Papyrus 800 to 807 are remedies to release a child from the belly of a woman, so to give birth. Um, so Ebers 800, it says, um, another to release a child in the belly of a woman, low Egyptian salt, white emma, something we don't know what it is. And um, it looks like um, they applied all these ingredients, they bandaged them, just below the abdominal area. There are some remedies that appear to describe aborting a fetus, or again, it could just mean giving birth. It, you know, it's difficult to tell, but um, Epis 797, for instance, reads another to cause a woman, sorry, another to cause a woman to give to the earth. Um, so in this remedy, the woman is told to sit naked um, on a plant. And um, presumably this would either cause delivery of the baby or an abortion, we're not sure. Papyrus Ramesseum, the fourth, it actually contains an incantation for giving birth. So generally the medical papyri don't give a lot of attention to complications that arise during the time of delivery. Uh, which again makes me feel that possibly the physicians weren't actually involved in the delivery itself. But the physicians, they did treat gynecological problems after birth. So um, chanting and magical spells were used in healing and deities were invoked to assist the patients. So we're gonna look at some of the specific deities in a minute. But I just want to have a look at um, how pregnancy was determined and the contraceptives that were used first. So Papyrus, Cahoon, Berlin and Carlsberg all contain pregnancy tests. So on this slide is a pregnancy test from Cahoon. And um, so it says to see if a woman will or will not bear a child, Emma and Bali. The lady should moisten with her urine every day, like dates and like sand in two bags. If they all grow, she will bear a child. If the barley grows, it will be a male. If the emma grows, it will be a female. If neither grows, she will not bear a child. So this was tested, by the way, 
<laughs> it was tested. And what they found in a, in a modern laboratory in Ginkari, what they found that if a woman wasn't pregnant, nothing grew. And if she was pregnant, it grew sort of over 50% of the time, which is pretty good. I think they were less successful in determining the sex of the child. But um, there is another pregnancy test. And this one is um, not as pleasant. <laughs> so basically you place an annual bulb in the vagina overnight. So if the odor of the onion could be smelled on a woman's breath by morning, then she was considered fertile. So if there's any volunteers out there who want to try this, let me know. <laughs> right. Um, so moving on to contraceptions. So contraception appears to have been mostly the responsibility of the women. Since most are some form of pessary, so women had to insert into the vagina. So um, in the Ebers, the contraceptive remedies begin from around Ebers 783. And it's beginning of the remedies that one prepares for women to cause a woman to stop being pregnant. Uh, so there's one which um, has part of acacia, colocynth, dates, finely grind with one henu of honey which is about 450 milliliters. The lint is moistened and introduced into her vagina. Now, there is a study apparently which found um, colocynth an effective contraceptive when given to male rats. In a separate study, acacia had the same effect on these poor male rats. I think really um, more studies would need to be conducted to verify this. But it's interesting, nevertheless. And honey um, is thought to clog the sperms and possibly have some spermicidal properties as well. So again, there's some sort of logic to this contraceptive. Um, but if anyone gets pregnant, uh, don't blame me if you try this. Um, so the Cahoon papyrus, um, you're probably all wondering why there's a crocodile here. It actually, um, the Cahoon recommends a pessary made of crocodile dung. And uh, we're looking at a mummified crocodile in this slide. I just thought you guys would prefer this to looking at crocodile dung. So um, who knows, perhaps this crocodile even provided his dung, who knows? Um, he's actually now in the Luxor Mummification Museum. I think he's amazing. He's, he's um, so well preserved. So whether or not they actually used crocodile dung or was that the name of some other element, it's difficult to say. Because, you know, we do have plants even now that are named after animals such as dogwood, catnip, etc. So it's just, you know, it's quite hard to imagine someone going out and collecting crocodile dung and women actually agreeing to use it. So we're not 100% sure, but um, who knows? Who knows? Maybe this guy did provide his dung, who knows? But I find that this is one of the, the greatest difficulties we have is um, identifying some of the ingredients. So, um, Makota et al. in 2004, are the first to identify a mummified human placenta um, from an Egyptian mummy. So this mummy was actually dated to the New Kingdom period and was discovered in Thebes. So the organ was first thought to be a liver, but after histological examination and studying the microstructural features of the organ, it was determined to be a placenta. And if you have a look at it, it does sort of resemble a little bit of the liver shape, but it is actually a placenta, and the placenta was hugely, hugely important for the ancient Egyptians. They actually called it the mother of mankind, and they understood the importance of it. It's an incredible, incredible organ. So the first pregnant mummy um, was published only last year by the Warsaw Mummy Project. Um, the mummy is actually housed in the National Museum in Warsaw, 
and was initially thought to be the remains of a priest. So it's not until CT uh, analysis was conducted and they actually found it was an embalmed woman. She's thought to be um, 20 to 30 years old when she died. And uh, she was 26 to 30 weeks pregnant. And um, if you have a look at these images, it looks like, it does look very much like a fetus. But this is highly, highly unusual. I've never, ever seen anything like this. Um, so the team, they basically say that the fetus began to pickle in an acidic environment of the uterus. So what they're saying is um, that formic acid and other compounds that are formed after death due to decomposition essentially change the pH inside this woman's body. So this change was from alkaline to acidic, which caused the leaching of minerals from the fetal bones, which began to dry out and mineralize. Now it has to be said, not everybody agrees with this verdict. So there is still a lot of debate going on. It's a tough one because um, both sides of the argument are interesting. And since this is a new find, it's very difficult. So I think, you know, maybe if we find a few more, we'll shed more light. But it's a really interesting case. Very interesting. We can talk more about this in the question and answers if anyone's interested. Um, so a mummified fetus was found in um, the tomb of Prince, actually it wasn't found in his tomb, but it's actually at the moment in his tomb, in Prince Kopchev's tomb in the Valley of the Queens. And um, the reason I wanted to share this is because it really shows the care that was given to children in ancient Egypt, that even with, um, with the fetus, they took a lot of care with the embalming. So children were very important to them. I think it's very touching to see this. Um, so we're going to look at breastfeeding now. So milk, as, as you know, is produced by mammals and it's the only substance that's specifically produced as a nourishing food. Now, breast milk is remarkable. It contains fatty acids, amino acids, carbohydrates, vitamins, antibodies, hormones, basically everything that is needed to help with the development of an infant. It, um, what's very interesting is that it also constantly changes as the child grows and fluctuates in the levels of lipids and vitamins, et cetera, to actually meet the needs of the growing baby. So ancient Egyptian women, they breastfed for around three years. Now, I, it has to be said, I'm not in any way trying to put pressure on women to breastfeed because I don't think it's fair to do this. There are many reasons why women don't breastfeed and it should be a personal decision. So I'm just looking at ancient Egypt right now. And um, we can see that it would have really benefited the health of their children at a time when infant mortality was high. So breastfeeding was in a short wave, um, a short wave ensuring the children were fed. So three years sounds quite a long time to us, but um, breast milk in times of hardship would have given their children the nutrients they needed. And the fact that milk also adapts to the needs of the growing child, I think would have really helped. Some of the elite women, they had wet nurses to breastfeed for them as well. And this, this is a great um, image uh, from the old kingdom period, because it's quite unusual in that period to find um, these sort of statues with women breastfeeding. Sophia, I just wanted to mention this idea of the uh, do nutria and um, the kind of image of the mother feeding a baby. And I was reading about how ancient Egypt didn't want, they would have used to sometimes different animals to be wet nurses in, in ancient times. And that 
um, it was considered bad for a donkey to be a wet nurse because um, they could pass on some of their stupid characteristics. And then the idea of that even carried on apparently into um, uh, French law, where women who had been charged with crimes weren't allowed to breastfeed their own children because it was considered they'd pass on some of their horrible criminal um, milk energies to them. <laughs> Wow, that is so interesting. It's amazing. And were, I bet were these decided by men, these laws? I would have thought so. But I mean, it's interesting that idea in, in a lot of these places whereby wet nursing was considered to be, um, you know, acceptable, which is something we obviously don't have very much uh, anymore, but actually would probably be great for people but I wonder whether it contributes to you know as you're nourishing your child does that diminish bone density or things like that so if you're repeatedly breastfeeding does it have an impact on the health and would it contribute to um you know the the uh, nutrition of the woman um going down absolutely I think you know it takes a lot out of a woman to breastfeed that's why when you're nursing you need to make sure they're eating really well of course, yeah, because the milk is made from the woman's body. So yeah, definitely. I'm not sure so much sure about the bone density, but that's that's an interesting thought. Um, you know, what is said of early osteoporosis. Um be interesting to find that out, but definitely would affect the health of the woman for sure. But I think you know, in ancient Egypt, it was mainly the wealthier women that had the wear nurses. So mostly women would have breastfed themselves. Um, okay, so next slide. Anyone can apparently breastfeed, like even a, an older woman can suddenly start lactating if needs must, if a baby demands it. And actually men even lactate as well, which I didn't realize. It's Very fascinating, isn't it? Because yeah, I was reading about this, like, you know, just this just uh, stimulating and um, it's just this hormone is produced, which produces a breast milk so yeah it's, it's fascinating so in times of need anybody could breastfeed I think e evolution is remarkable now we've got men onto contraceptives need to get them into breastfeeding a bit more <laughs> <laughs> did you watch um, meet the parents the comedy uh, it, no, he, he talks about um that he basically he extracted milk from a cat I don't know if anybody, but I love, I love those films, Meet the Parents, um, Meet the Pockers. Um, who's the, Robert De Niro. It's a Robert De Niro comedy. Um, yeah, watch, watch the movie, it's really funny. Uh, so where was I? Right, so, okay. Um, so in this slide, we can see um, vessels that were exclusively for breast milk. So breast milk was thought to have magical power and medicinal benefits. And of course, breast milk does have medicinal benefits. Um, it has hormones, vitamins, everything that a child needs. So there are remedies actually in the medical papyri which actually use breast milk. Some of these are for head colds, burns, rashes. So it's interesting. It's interesting that they're using breast milk. Um, there are remedies for the breast itself. Um, Ebers 808, for example, is beginning of remedies not to let the two breasts sink down. So I'm guessing this means, you know, just um, sagging. The breasts are smeared with the blood of one whose menses has just begun. Her belly and both thighs should be smeared. So I'm thinking this is sympathetic medicine that someone who's young, if you have their period blood is going to make your breasts youthful again. That's all the rage now, though, as well, isn't it? The um, plasma of young blood being used by billionaires to, um, you know, boost up their own longevity. That's really interesting. Doesn't um, it contain a lot of stem cells, menstrual blood? Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, it's interesting. And placenta as well is an incredible organ. So... I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't use it myself, but it's interesting. I wouldn't want to ask my daughter. <laughs> Actually, we've both got daughters, so you know, we, this could be, yeah, we could do an experiment. <laughs> so, um, 
Oh, so Evers 810 is also a remedy for the breast if it is diseased. And um, that particular remedy um, has got ox barley, and flies, excrement, ochre, and you make it into a mass and then you anoint it for four days. I don't know how they're getting the flies excrement. I don't know. Hebes 811 is an incantation for the breast to the goddess Isis. So some, some of the remedies, I can see a lot of logic, but some of them, I, I, you know, I think, is it a word that we don't actually understand? So we're interpreting it as five sex women, but it actually means something else. Something to think about. Um, Okay, so let's have a look at some other gynecological remedies. So um, examples of uterine prolapse have been discovered in human remains. So this is when the pelvic floor muscles weaken and don't provide enough support for the uterus. And as a result of this, the uterus, it slips down or protrudes out of the vagina. So although this can happen at any age, it usually affects postmenopausal women who've had a few babies. So there are remedies in Ebers 789 to 795 to cause the uterus to go down to its place, which um, is likely referring to a pro prolapsed uterus. So some of the remedies um, suggest fumigation, and we've seen the fumigation vessel that they used. Others are rubbed into the pubic area, and some of the remedies are to be drunk. Um, they used a lot of ingredients, but some of the ingredients were honey, resin, pine sawdust, and um, these are the remedies they use when they're doing the application. Um, there's a Ever 793 is a fumigation one. And in this, they're using dry human excrement and is added to terebinth resin. And the woman is fumigated with the fumes and they're supposed to penetrate into her vagina. Um, in Cahoon, there's um, an interesting remedy, which is examination of a woman aching in her molars, her front and her ears so much that she hears no word. You should say of it, it is terrors of the womb. You should treat it with the same prescription used for removing dretitus of the womb. Now this remedy, it could be related to pregnancy or post-pregnancy because it's quite common for pregnant women to suffer with ear infections and sensitivity in their teeth. I, my teeth are very sensitive, I won't forget. So I think that this is what this is referring to. Um, so now we're going to have a look at some of the popular deities related to women and children. So I'm going to focus on Bess, Tauret and Hathor. Bess is a personal favorite of mine. He's an adorable achondroplastic dwarf. And some people say he's scary, but I find him really cute and adorable. And he was popular throughout Egyptian history, including the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. In fact, he gets really popular during those periods. So he was um, popular at Dera Medina, and we had a look at the, the village earlier. And in this village, they had um, these box bed type structures, and they were discovered in the front rooms of the houses. And they were thought to be areas where deities such as Bess were invoked. Women even had tattoos of this. So he was um, very popular. Here's another close up of him. <laughs> um, Bess and Tauret um, were seen as guardians of the divine infants that were worshipped in the birth houses of temples during this period, during the Ptolemaic period. So, temple and magical texts give Bess the role of opening the womb to allow a child to be born. So if I go here and show you this. So Papyrus Leiden actually has an incantation intended to hasten a birth, a difficult birth. 
And it says, O oh, good dwarf, come on account of the one who sent you. Come down, placenta, come down, placenta, come down. So these words were to be said four times over a dwarf of clay placed on the crown of the head of a woman who is giving birth and suffering. So this is, uh, so we have a look um, here. So scenes of births, similar to those at birth houses were often painted on the walls of homes um, at Dero Medina to encourage fertility and ensure protection for mother and child. So Beth, um, he was a bit of a character. He loved music and dance, and um, he knew how to entertain a newborn as well. But he was also equipped to repel demons. So he appears on cosmetic containers, amulets, and wands. So here we've got him in um, in Dendera. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. So this um, is a picture I took a couple of weeks ago. So they've got these little chambers and they're all decorated with um, images of bears. Uh, Tauret was another favorite household deity. So she has the head of a hippo, legs and arms of a lion, the tail of a crocodile, and human breasts. And this one is, is quite an unusual image of her. And this, this is in Luxor Museum. So I found it, I've not really seen one like this before, though it was quite interesting. She also sometimes appears with Hecate, the frog goddess. And um, the servant of Hecate is a term which might be referring to a mid midwife. So going back to Tauret. So Tauret's a great example of a deity that combines all the fierce and protective powers rolled into one. So like Bess, she appears on abstract wands that are usually made of hippopotamus ivory. She also provides an early example of of the practice of combining all of these powers into one image. Right. So these blocks are from Dendra temples. As you walk in, they've got these huge Hathor blocks, which I think are so beautiful. So Hathor, of course, is the cow goddess, and she makes an appearance as early as the Old Kingdom period in which she was venerated as a divine mother of the pharaohs. This could be because humans came to depend on the cow's milk and consequently, consequently formed this nurturing bond. In fact, the temple of Hatshepsut in Luxor features an example of this in the form of a statue of the queen suckling from the teat of Hathor. So there, there's images of Hathor in temples such as Dendra, and this one is actually on the rooftop of Dendro. It was closed for a while, but they've opened it up again. So it's right at the top. And it's, it's quite small, but it's very cute. So she actually remained a popular deity and was invoked to help with problems related to conception, childbirth, and generally women's health. Here she is again. This is in the basement of Dendra. So would invoking deities, carrying amulets, incantations, and even tattoos of best helped? So the ancient Egyptians, they used uh, prophylactic methods, which prevent disease, apotropaic um, methods, which actually avert evil influences. So I think these methods would be the modern equivalent of the placebo effect, whereby through psychosomatic means, homeostasis is achieved. So the brain is, um, is an incredible, incredible organ. And clinical trials have demonstrated that placebos can affect the same neurological pathways that are stimulated with actual medicine. So dopamine receptors are activated resulting in physiological responses such as increased pain relief. 
the immune system can have a positive effect from meditation, prayers, and chanting. So these methods can alleviate stress. So the answer is they probably at some level did work. So um, sadly throughout history, um, there's always been physical and sexual violence towards women and ancient Egypt is no exception. But in comparison to their contemporaries, evidence suggests that women had more legal rights, particularly middle to upper social classes. So women could report violence against them and attempt to have the perpetrator made accountable. So evidence of physical trauma through interpersonal violence does exist. An example is here is um, of Takabuti, who was um, a murder victim. She lived around 2,600 years ago. We've got, um, she's now in the Ulster Museum. I've got, a, there, I've got a picture of her. So her murder was determined by a recent multidisciplinary study, which was conducted by Ulster Museum. And I'm proud to say the k &H Centre as well at the University of Manchester. So what they discovered was that she was finally stabbed in the upper back near her left shoulder. So very sad way to die. And in fact, they discovered that she was probably running as she died as well. So there's a medical remedy in the Cahoon papyrus that um, in my opinion is written for a rape victim. And there is examination of a woman aching in her front and all her limbs as if she had been beaten. You should save it to say of it, it is of the womb. You should treat it with a diet of oil until she is well. Now, there are cases of uh, violence towards women. There's a case of a man called Paneb at Dera Medina village. He's accused of several crimes, including sexual assault of a woman. The fact that there is a written record of this and the accuser was asking for him to pay for his crimes shows that assault against women was taken seriously. But we have to ask ourselves, was domestic violence taken seriously? There is evidence of domestic violence towards women, again, in Dera Medina. Because Dera Medina provides us a lot of um, information. And what we find is that um, there's examples of women appealing to the authorities when acts of violence were committed towards them. And this really tells us that women did have rights. And I think sometimes when we're looking at ancient Egypt, we have to compare them to their contemporaries when women didn't have as many rights. So there's an ostracon in which um, a man is absent from work for actually beating his wife. And this is probably reported because he had to answer for his actions. Um, we do have to remember that um, although a high percentage of domestic violence is committed by men, women can be violent too. I think it's important to remember that. There, um, there are more depictions of acts of violence by men. Um, we find this mainly in a war battle scenario, but there are a few depictions of women as well. For instance, we have Queen Nefertiti smiting the enemies. We, we see a Jeb search, she's trampling on the enemies. But um, interestingly, what we find is like with Nefertiti, she appears to be smiting women, not men. And the men appear to be shown smiting other men and not women. So these could be cultural representations and not necessarily depictions of actual events. Psychological abuse, I feel, is more difficult to detect. But what I wanted to do today was actually just to touch on this subject. It's, it's, it's quite a huge subject, which I'm hoping to do a future lecture on maybe later on in the year. But I felt like it was it's important to at least mention it today. 
I'm going to finish off today's talk by talking about disability um, and the status of women. So I want to talk about women with um, physical disabilities, how have they been treated in ancient Egypt? So there are some wisdom texts um, written during the Ramesside period. And this is a period when Dera Medina village was very active. So these texts are believed to be written by a scribe and they seem to be aimed at children. So texts such as these provide us the opportunity to understand the morality of Egyptian society. Doesn't mean that they were always followed, but it tells us a little bit about morality at least. So um, there is reference made to people with disabilities. They don't actually use the word disability. I don't know if there was actually a word for disability in ancient Egypt, but the conditions that they tell us about are conditions that we would treat as disabilities. So reference is made to um, a contraplacia, which is a type of dwarfism, blindness, difficulty walking, etc. So what these uh, wisdom texts specify is not to ridicule or tease anyone who has disabilities, because all these people were created by the gods and should therefore be treated properly. I think it's so beautiful to find this from ancient Egypt. It's very touching. Um, the ancient Egyptians also had Bess as one of their favorite household deities. He was, of course, depicted in the form of a dwarf with a chondroplasia. And we also find that the gods themselves were not depicted as perfect. So you have um, these passages where you read about Ra, He's described as this aging God struggling with his health. So it's interesting that if you, you know, they did not expect perfection. So examination of um, human remains from various archeological sites, including Dera Medina, and Anne Austin did a study on um, Dera Medina. She, did, she wrote a dissertation on this, uh, which shows that people with disabilities would have been taken care of. There's an example of a lady named Geheset who lived during the late Middle Kingdom period. And uh, she lived until the age of between 50 to 60 with cerebral palsy, which I think is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. She was a woman of high status, she was married. Uh, we also have examples of prosthesis from ancient Egypt, such as this one which was found on a woman. And uh, it, you know, there's evidence of wear and tear, which shows that it would have been worn. And this woman apparently lived between the ages of 50 to 60 as well. So absolutely remarkable and like to end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was so fascinating. Loads of really interesting, niche, detailed information that I just had no idea about. So fascinating. Thank you so much. There was a couple of questions I wanted to ask before I um, open things up. One of them was um, about menstruation and this idea of um, uh, what women would have used to um, soak up menstrual blood. And I know that there's this idea of using the knot of Isis or, the, or that the Tiet symbol is a sign for some sort of sanitary, um, sanitary towel type of thing. Do you, do you know anything about that? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> exactly what you said, yeah, just a bit of linen. And yeah, that knot was associated with periods as well. So that's basically what we think that they used. And was menstrual blood used, you said about it being used in that kind of magical context and, you know, is known that is obviously, you know, as far as um, that living in that kind of place, it's a very rich source of nutrients, I guess. And so I can imagine that it would be utilised perhaps in, in medicine. Was there other examples of uh, menstrual blood being used in um, spells or um, medicine recipes for treatment? There's um, not a huge amount, I have to say, not a huge amount, but mainly it seems that it was used in, um, to help with the breast itself. But yeah, there's, there's 
very few, and I can't remember them on the top of my head, but we don't come across that sort of blood that often. There's a lot of remedies with human excrement. There's quite, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's a few with human excrement. So they did use bodily fluids. So they're using um, period blood, they're using breast milk, excrement, and not just of humans, of animals as well. Is there anything in the human um, excrement that could be seen these days as having some good use? Because I know you can get faecal transplants these days. So maybe they were ahead of the game on that front. 100% they were ahead of the game because um, some of the remedies, that is what they're using. They're actually using um, a baby's excrement. Mm. And I'm, I'm assuming quite a newborn baby. And a newborn baby, um, his excrement so is feeding on his mother's breast milk. So it's full of probiotics, you know, all nutrients. And um, there's evidence that, so basically they used it um, for an eye remedy, to help with an eye remedy. So um, it'd be worth okay. it. Possibly. <laughs> I don't know if it will help, but I can see the logic and the rationale. The good thing is when... Um, breast milk is good think... for an eye condition, isn't it? I know that what breast is milk it? is good. Breast milk is good for things like conjunctivitis and stuff like that. And then they did use breast milk as well for eye infections as well. So I, I think they were ahead of the game. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask? I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Um, are there many mentions um, with regards to mental health issues? That is the thing that is so tricky to find. It's, it's really reading between the lines and there's, there's some verses which you read, which you do think that this is talking about mental health, but it's really, really difficult, I feel personally, to know for sure if it's about mental health, but that's a hugely brilliant question. <laughs> that's a very good question. Would that be something that would be more likely the domain of a religious functionary, maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, their, their medication, their, sorry, their medicine was not just provided by physicians, there's um, priests were involved as well. They sort of had um, a holistic view of medicine. So I think, you know, some of the in incantations particularly would have been very therapeutic, more to do with the mindset as well. And um, one thing I noticed when you mentioned about the, um, what was it for? It was for some female health issue, I can't remember which one now, but about um, using asses urine or using donkeys urine. And I know that um, doesn't, melatonin is still often like made out of donkeys urine. And uh, would they have utilized melatonin for some purpose? I don't know if they they would have understood the concept of melatonin, but I think, you know, with the Egyptian physicians, they're always on the right track. They obviously experimented a lot, mm. but, um, and they did use urine of animals in quite a lot of remedies. So I think, you know, in this case, it looks like the urine was used because it was a donkey that had just given birth so it was used for the hormone, the hormonal aspect. They obviously knew that by using this, it does alleviate some of the menopausal symptoms. So I think that's fascinating. I think it's um, very fascinating that we don't really hear about menopause in relation to ancient Egypt. Mm, no, I know it's it's really. I think it, you raise a really good point as well because I remember when my daughter was a bit younger, she was really into horrible histories, and I love horrible histories. It's really funny, but they're always mocking Egyptian recipes or ancient cultural recipes. And actually, like you say, there's really if you look into it, you dig into it, there are some really interesting medical know-how that they possessed because, like you say, with the donkey's urine and other things that sound really ridiculous to us, actually do have healing benefits. So mm -hmm. I've been just been writing about uh, Mesopotamian medicine and it's very, it sounds very similar in that regard. And I wonder if there's any sense of uh, medical know-how, how, how tra being transmitted from the Near East or back and forth. Do you know, there must have been, 
There must have been, and I even find that um, often what is said that, so you've got the ancient Egyptians and then you have the Ptolemaic period where suddenly we're expected to forget about the ancient Egyptian medicine and we're moving on to Greek medicine, but I don't think it would have been that way. They would have um, learned from each other. So when, the, when we get to the Ptolemaic and the Roman period, I don't think Egyptian medicine would have just disappeared. They would have been sharing each other's ideas. And obviously we now know that ancient Egypt ethnically it was diverse. So there would have been other cultural influences for sure. I imagine as well that quite a lot of this medical folk wisdom would have been transmitted into Coptic eras and is probably in certain pockets still known about as well. I mean, I, I love the island of Crete. And if you go to Crete, the, the people there have a lot of understanding of their natural herbs and um, plants and things like that. They've sort of maintained that um, folk, herbal folk knowledge. So do you see any example of remedies that seem to have very ancient roots in more modern populations in Egypt? I think um, you are absolutely correct in saying that some of those remedies were transmitted to the Coptic period because there are, there are definitely examples of those. And what I find interesting is um, that magic is still performed in Egypt. And some of the magic that is performed is very similar to the magic that was performed in ancient Egypt itself, particularly where the ancient Egyptians felt that the name of the person was very important. So sometimes they wouldn't give the real name because they didn't want somebody to use black magic and put a curse on somebody. So even with the magicians, they do exist in Egypt at the moment, they will use a person's name and then write them on a piece of paper and they would do spells. So this is something that still happens. Is there, isn't there, there um, a kind of religious group, that, like the Tsar or something like that? Am I saying, is it the right thing? I think there's, there's some kind of interesting religious magical practice that is sort of shamanic and is part of Egyptian culture these days. And I wonder if um, that has sort of influences. I think it's called Tsar. Oh yeah, so it's like an African culture called Tsar that is still popular in Egypt amongst people today. And I, and I imagine that they probably have some kind of interesting folk medicine and magical rituals as well. I keep meaning to look more into their, their activities. <laughs> Just mentioned that melatonin helps the sleep waking cycle. Yeah, that's why I'm really interested in it because I'm really interested in dream culture and um, sleeping. And actually that's a good point. So what are the, the best sleep remedies or is there mention of insomnia or sleep disorders or anything like that? I think, um, we, well, we, we do feel that they had some sleep disorders. They definitely had sleep paralysis because there's mention of sleep paralysis. And, but they did um, look at sleeping and dreaming completely differently from the way that we perceive it. They believed that the dead would come and visit them in their sleep. And I think a lot, you have to read between the lines. So some of the things that we're reading are probably sleep disorders, mm. especially sleep paralysis for sure. And they did have remedies, again, with beer and bread and honey and other ingredients they, they would take to help them with their sleep. So yeah, I think we talked quite a bit about this in a previous presentation. Yeah, we've, we've also had, he has done one previously that touched mm -hmm. on um, sleep and dreams. And then we've also had Kasia Zapakowska, who is um, really, it's her sort of main subject of interest is sleeping and dreaming and nightmares in ancient Egypt. And she describes the kind of sleep paralysis experience quite um, vividly in the way that they're describing it. And I think also this idea um, that perpetuates into ancient Greek ideas about dreaming as well, and is also apparent in Mesopotamian ideas about dreaming, is that you are visited by, you can be visited by a dream. So a nightmare is like this entity with its own agency and volition. And so therefore you would be extra terrified because you don't feel like it's generating from your, you know, neuroses or psyche. You feel that it's actually something that's coming to get you. And, and Kasia did mention this... Mm. Um, because at, at certain shrines, people would take letters to the dead. And she mentioned this instance of someone taking a letter to the dead. And in the letter, they're saying, can you stop 
attacking me and abusing me in my dream please because they had obviously done something bad to that person before they died and they felt that this person was taking vengeance against them um, from the the afterlife so yeah really interesting concepts have a look at the, the Kasha talks as well Luigi Prada is also a dream expert and he's done some talks for the Explorers Club as well Anyone else have any other questions? Let me see. I think I did see one. Um, Keith mentions trauma, head trauma can cause tumors which affect the pituitary gland and alter hormone levels as well. Mm -hmm. I know that I've read that the ancient Egyptians, their word for brain translates to something like skull awful. So they didn't see it as a, being an especially important part of the anatomy. Um, well, I'm actually writing my dissertation on this, so I'll talk about it when I finish that. <laughs> I'm working on it at the moment. Um, that can be a lecture towards the end of the year because I've nearly finished. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love that. Mm -hmm. I, when I started off Explorers Club, um, we were mostly doing neuroscience lectures actually and it morphed only into explorers Egyptology uh, during lockdown because um, that was my sort of particular interest at the time while I was learning hieroglyphs and then it's just stuck <laughs> so we will be coming full circle with I'm, I'm fascinated with the brain so yeah I'll, I'll definitely do a lecture on the concept of the brain in ancient Egypt maybe later on in the year yeah, because you get all of these, uh, you know, that sort of ancient alien brigade where they show the uh, pituri is it the pituri gland or the the um, pineal gland, and they try to make yeah. it the eye of Horus and the eye of Ra, and seems, um, you know, very, very bizarre overlaying of patterns. But, um, but yeah, you can find a pattern in anything if you look for it. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you've got a highlighter pen, you can make a pattern. Yeah, exactly, you can. Um, I love how in these documentaries you'll see some sort of like protuberance of earth or a lump and then there's drawn over the top of it something completely different. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, anyone else have any other questions? Um, no, everyone's just like, thanks, Sophia. That was fantastic. Everyone. Mm -hmm enjoyed it um as i said i'm going to record this or i have recorded this so i'll send you a recording i'm sorry to anyone that came in late as i was saying there were like a few people that um just came in at the last minute so if you did miss the beginning you'll get a recording of it tomorrow morning probably because it does take me quite a long time to upload this um so i'll just let you get on with the rest of your evening sophia thank you so much that was absolutely fascinating and brilliant and lots and lots of things for me to think about research a bit more as well that was so great thank, um, you. thank you everybody for coming today taking time off your sunday thank you okay bye everyone see you bye soon everybody i'm just thinking what's next week uh next week is well actually saturday we've got barry kemp talking about the wow. yeah. Um, Mountain. yeah so lots of other ones coming up. Do check out the website and see what ones we've got booked. And as I said, we'll be booking those British Museum ones soon as well. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. See you later. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.